Morning everyone, this is Rick Janelle. I'm uh, once again uh, using Tammy's little uh, classroom in the basement that she teaches Chinese students with. We had a, a huge windstorm come through our area not last night but the night before. Uh, the winds were clocked at the, uh, the uh, Omaha airport at 70 miles an hour and uh, at Offutt Air Force Base they were clocked at 95. So there's trees down, there's power down. Um, I believe that some of the people that had been without power in the Bellevue area got their power about midnight last night. Uh, in fact, by this time in the morning, they may be, uh, the power may be on at the church building, but uh, as of 6 o'clock last night, it was not up, and uh, as of bedtime, it was not up. And uh, so uh, our elders decided to, uh, to uh, tell everybody to stay home. Some of you will have looked out in your yard and say, I don't understand what the problem is. There's nothing wrong in my yard. And others will look and say, I don't know how I'm going to fix all this mess. I, I had uh, several limbs come out of trees. None of them landed on my house, but it's going to be a while to get my backyard cleaned up. And uh, so, anyway, if wherever you are today, uh, if, if you're if you're dealing with a storm or the aftermath of a storm, be careful. Uh, help your neighbors. Uh, be patient. Uh, if you see some uh, power guys out working around, toss them a water bottle or at least a wave. Don't scowl at them because. While you've been uh, waiting and resting on them, resting and waiting on them to come and take care of your power, there's hundreds of them that have been in and out day and night away from their families, and uh, we would be, be thankful for the things that people do for us. I want to talk to you this morning about uh, the idea of the, the, the church being like a bride. We've been talking on Sunday mornings about different ways that, that God uses to describe what He means by the word church. What we mean by the church, word church many times does not match what, what God says. Uh, we have in our minds what we want a church to be, what we want a church to do. Uh, even this morning, I would imagine that half of our church members think that, you know, canceling service with no power and no fans and no light was a, a good thing. And probably a third to a half think, oh, I don't understand what the problem is. We used to meet in a church with no air conditioning. The problem is there's all kinds of variables and times change. If, for example, in our building, we don't have, build, we don't have windows that open. And we don't have good lighting. And, uh, uh, you know, so, well, why, why couldn't we meet someplace? Okay, well, we'll bring 130, 140 people to your living room. Well, wait, I didn't mean my living room. Yeah, see, there's the problem. Um, elders have to make these kinds of decisions. And these kind of decisions come up in the church. And it's like the kind of decisions that you have to make in a family and in a marriage. And so it makes sense that God would say, but there's a way in which his church is, is like a bride. Um, it fills a lot of the same roles, saw the same, uh, same purposes. Let's read together Ephesians 5, starting in 25 through verse 32. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the wa washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Um, verse 29, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, will be united to his wife, and the two will become flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So Paul's point here is that uh, um, he's trying to use the example of a healthy, functioning marriage as an illustration of what the relationship between Christ and his church is like. And in the ancient days, just like in the modern day today, sometimes that image breaks down because humans don't always have healthy, functioning marriages. We don't act as we should. We don't treat each other as we should. We don't set the example that we should. And so when people look at our marriages and they say, oh, that, uh, that dysfunction is what the dysfunctional church is like. That's not, not really how, what God had, had in mind. And so in his teaching about this, he threw in a little bit about how husbands should treat their wives. And I have to admit that I don't always live up to those teachings. I, I, I try, but I don't always live up to them. And no, in fact, no one does. Uh, and so there's all kinds of ways that this image, like any other image, kind of breaks down, you know. Um, human imagery just doesn't seem to work well for the thoughts and the mind of God. And, and yet that's all that God has when he's trying to communicate with us is how does he translate 
the things from his thoughts and his ways into our ways and our thoughts when the two are not the same. And uh, even people on the earth have different languages and different ways of seeing things. So I'd like for you to remember just uh, a little bit this morning, if you would, those of you that are married, those of you that are contemplating being married, um, why don't you think back about the vows that you made, the vows that husbands and wives uh, make to each other. I'm, I'm planning to do a, a wedding for a young couple in uh, Pennsylvania next weekend that I promised to do three years ago. And uh, I'll be asking them of some vows. I'll be asking them to make some promises in front of people. They're going to stand in front of their family and friends and they're going to promise some things to each other. And the group that's watching will be asked to do some things to support and help them as a, as a community going forward. Um, but do you remember the vows that you made? Do you remember the promises that you made? Or if you're thinking of being married in the future, will be asked to make? I know it's popular these days for people to write their own vows. And, you know, that's, that's fine too. There's a very, very small list of things that God gives for what he requires to be a valid marriage in his eyes. But at least in the United States, it's traditional for husbands and wives to promise some things to each other. And there are traditional vows. And, and uh, if you choose to follow tradition, uh, you'll hear something like, uh, uh, do you, Rick, promise to take Tammy to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you promise to love her and honor her and submit to her, care for her? And she'll be asked to do the same thing. And we live in a, we live in a world today where people sometimes feel bristle at some of those words and they'll say, well, I like those old promises, but I want to change a few of them because these are modern days and I'm a modern woman and I, I don't want to submit to a man. I don't want to, I don't want to, and sometimes men will say, well, you know, this is supposed to be the days of, uh, of equal, e equal value and equal work. And uh, I don't think I want to sign up for doing more than my share in this marriage. Uh, it, it becomes a problem. It becomes a way to think about things. But the point is, there was somewhere in your, our past a set of promises that we made to each other. We looked each other in the eye, and in front of family and friends, we said, I do. I do. And if you were married in a, in a Judeo-Christian tradition, part of that vow was to, to stand by each other and to help each other for as long as you live. Not as long as you like. Not as long as you want. Not as long as it feels easy. We promised, we said, I do, to be as long as... As, 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 as long as, 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 as we're alive. And uh, I'm clicking out of cover, cover here so I can see my, uh, my uh, picture here. There we go. That's what I was looking to see. So um, the problem is the reality in our world is that marriages don't live up to what they should. Uh, even, in, even in Christian churches, uh, a third to a half of all marriages are in divorce. And... Uh, and, and yet, for all the failures and for all the weaknesses and for all the problems and for all the times that it fails, uh, human marriage is still the best hope for intimacy and lifelong friendship. Some people say, wow, if that's the best hope, I have no hope. Well, that may be true. That may be true because this is a, this is a serious thing. And uh, if, if you go into a marriage thinking, oh, it's a 50-50 proposition, you're wrong. From day to day, from hour to hour, it's more like 100-100. There's times that you do all the giving, and there's times that you do all the taking. And if you get tired of doing all the giving, or if you get uh, um, too lazy in all the taking, uh, you can destroy the foundation that your family was built on. And yet, that's still the best hope that we have. There's nothing else in, in, in the world that brings the intimacy and the friendship, the true bonding that a marriage can if we work at it and, and, and don't get lazy. Uh, we find the right person, if we are the right person. Those are the things that Jesus, I mean, excuse me, that Paul means when God through him says that the church is like the bride of Christ. There's supposed to be a relationship between a bride and a husband that is different from anybody else's. It's, it's different from being a parent. It's different from being a child. It's different from being a best friend or a co-worker or a business partner or uh, a, a battle partner on a, on a, on a, on a, on a war field someplace. Marriage is truly different. It's truly unique. And so is the relationship between Christ and the church. It's truly different and truly unique. Um, I had some pictures from my slides on Sunday that i got to show you. Here's, a, uh, here's a, a, a picture of Tammy and I. Let me see if my camera is right. Yeah, there it goes. You can see it pretty good, I think. Yeah. Uh, 
And that was uh, one of our anniversary. We were at our oldest daughter's house, and uh, the kids had put together this uh, this plaque for us. If you didn't get a chance to read it, it says, uh, Rick, heart, 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 Tammy, Vanell, established December 29th, 1977. Tammy and I were married in 1977. And uh, it's been both the, both the best and the hardest thing that ever happened to me. And I know that she would tell you the same thing. Um, we did not know what we were getting into. We did not understand all the promises that we made. But we made them anyway. And uh, that's what happens with a Christian. Christians don't totally understand what they're promising. They don't totally understand what they're going to get into because life is uncertain and problems come that you never dreamed. Uh, would be part of your life. Uh, just think about the year we spent in, in isolation from COVID. Think about uh, waking up in the middle of the night two nights ago with the wind whistling and roaring through the trees. Um, just hours before those things, days before those things, we had no we had no knowledge that we would need to live faithfully as citizens and as families and uh, as good neighbors in those things. We didn't know what that meant, and yet. We did know that we could make promises that we would do our very, very best to live up to. And that's what happens with Christ and the church. Um, the, 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 marriage is, uh, the, the marriage is like a, a metaphor for God and his people. And it's true all the way back in the Old Testament. Hosea chapter 2, Isaiah 62, God through the prophets talked about himself and the nation of Israel. He presented himself as a, as a husband and uh, presented them as his wife, and he talked about how that they had been unfaithful to him, and, and how that he had taken them back, and had uh, restored the relationship, and they were unfaithful again, and he would take them back, and they were unfaithful again, and he would take them back. Now, in this case, the image through the prophets was that the marriage between God and the nation of Israel was a dysfunctional marriage, and that God was the faithful partner that was being aggrieved and was, was, was being cheated on. And yet he kept coming back for more and more. That tells us something about God. It tells us something about what Paul meant when he said that Christ is the uh, head of the church, that he is the, 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 the husband and, and the, the wife is, uh, is, is, is the church. We too are, are constantly unfaithful. We too never live up to the promises that we make to God. Um, and yet God constantly restores us, constantly helps us, constantly... Uh, brings us back into the fold of his marriage. I, had, I used to hear people sometimes say, well, well if, if God thinks that being a bride is so great, why didn't he call himself the bride? And the answer to that is because all the way back into the Old Testament, the bride was always the unfaithful one. Well, it's not so today, I understand, but the Bible was written for you. It was preserved for you, but it was not written to you. It was primarily written to people who made promises to God and didn't keep them, promises to God and didn't keep them. God kept his promises, Israel didn't. So which are you? Are you the promise keeper or are you the one that didn't? If you're honest, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're honest, you have to say you've made promises to God that you didn't keep. And I'm so glad that God uh, of the New Testament is still the husband of the Old Testament who takes me back and restores me and, and forgives me and lets me try again. Uh, that's the image we, imagery that we find in Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, I'm so glad that it's there. i got another picture to show you here. I'll let, uh, I'll let Tammy tell you which birthday party this was. But there, yeah, there it is. We, uh, we had a birthday party for her recently, not recently, but a few years ago. Uh, it was a big milestone birthday for her, and uh, we went to a place where they had these big, huge goblets. They put the... Uh, the, 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 the rainbow uh, straws in them for people that were having birthdays. And we had been in there before and she had seen that and she said, you know, I want one of those for that, that milestone birthday. And so we went in there and we got one of those and, and uh, had a picture made. Uh, one of the things that marriage does, you know, a, good, a good marriage does is a good marriage celebrates milestones. And uh, Tammy and I have been together a bunch of times, about a bunch of years. We've gone to a bunch of restaurants. We've uh, had good times. We've had, had bad times. And it's good once in a while to just say, you know, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a milestone in our marriage here. There's a milestone in our life. God does that for us as well. And in, in chapter 5, he talks about how there's this, this, this metaphor for marriage. 
And he talks about a healthy couple, how they should treat each other, especially how a husband should treat a wife. Because generally speaking, guys, let's be honest. Generally speaking, aren't we the more stubborn one, usually? Generally, isn't, the, isn't it the man that gets angry the quickest? I understand there's angry women. I understand there's abused men. But isn't it usually the other way around? Aren't we the dysfunctional ones? Aren't we the, aren't we the ones that usually start the problems either by what we do or what we don't do, a careless word or a, a harsh word, and she takes it wrong, and then she lashes back? Well, who, 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 who started that? Well, you know, I saw a T-shirt the other day where a guy where it says, uh, if a man tells you he'll do something, you don't have to remind him every month for three years. <laughs> he'll do it. <laughs> well, that's true, right? We men think, well, you know, as long as I, as long as it's still in my mind, it's on my list, I just haven't done it yet. And she says, but I asked you to do that a month ago. I asked you to do that three years ago. Don't you love me anymore? Uh, isn't it important to you what I want? And then you're off to the races. You know, you've got this long simmering dispute between the two of you that simply started because... You agreed to do something. If you weren't going to do it, just tell her, I'm not doing that. Don't get her hopes up and then make her wait three years and remind you every month about it. See, that's, that's, that's part of the problem with marriages. But in the church, Christ is not that way. And, and, and yet there's that relationship between Christ and the church. The, the, the church wants things from Christ. The church wants things from its husband. Um, and the most intimate relationship between two humans on the planet it's the husband and wife relationship. What's God trying to say? He's trying to say that he views the church the way a healthy, normal husband views a, no, a healthy, normal wife in a marriage relationship. And the idea is that God is going to behave as a, as a good, strong, normal, healthy husband will behave towards a wife. He'll be protective. He'll be jealous. There'll be things like that 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 that, that, that come up, and you'll see that God is be, just being a normal, healthy, normal husband. And what's expected from the church is that we're to, we're expected to fill the role of a wife. And the role of a wife is to be faithful and to be helpful. It's the it's it's historically the wife that uh, sets their career on hold to have children. It's it's the wife that that many times we'll have to move and take a new job for a husband's advancement. We're living in a world today where there are women who are the major breadwinner in families, and I understand that. And, and if that works for you and your family, then God bless you. But listen, you know, the point is, God is the one who's the leader of this relationship. And we are supposed to be healthy and helpful and hopeful and loving in that relationship. And that's what the idea of submission means. In a healthy marriage, somebody has to be where the buck stops. Somebody has to be the one that is the uh, stricter disciplinary with the kids. Somebody has to be the one that says no on the spending of money. Somebody has to be the one who finally says, yes, we'll go to that party, or no, we won't. And while it's, it's, it's all taken under advisement, it's all taken under, under discussion, which is exactly the way God does with his church, by the way, uh, the final buck, the final responsibility, the final say-so falls in the lap of Jesus with the church. And according to the scriptures, in a healthy, functioning Christian marriage, that's the role that husbands are supposed to play. Husbands are not the leaders of their family in that they're sitting up on a throne being brought a glass of iced tea and, and all their whims taken care of. What it means to be the head of a household is that you're the one that bears the responsibility. You're the one that carries the biggest loads. You're the one... That, that, that provides the greatest protection against danger. All those things are what Jesus does for his church. And uh, fortunately for us, he does much of that in the spirit realm where you and I have very little strength and very little power. And he's able to do things for us as, as his bride that we cannot do uh, for ourselves. And so just briefly looking through that chapter 5 of Ephesians, we find that Christ loves his church. That... Uh, he loves the church despite what she was and what she is and the problems that she causes today. Uh, he loves her so much that he marries her. He loves her as much as he loves himself. And then Paul says something that's very quite shocking. This is something that I'm still studying. I still don't quite get. But it is, it is, it is, it is uh, tough in that verses 30 through 32, 
Christ describes his relationship with the church as being very similar to the conjugal one or the marriage bed between a husband and wife. There's nothing more intimate. There's nothing more embarrassing. There's nothing more private. There's nothing more serious than the sex life between a husband and wife. And he's not saying here that God has a physical body, that he has physical sex with his physical church. There are cult leaders that say that's true and that will sometimes, like the David Koresh in, uh, in uh, uh, Texas did, where he would take his followers' wives away and put them in a special building and said they couldn't have sex with them, that it was only supposed to be sex with him because he claimed to be God on earth. Uh, cult leaders claim that. That's not the point that God, God's not talking about the physical realm here. But somehow he's saying that in the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, the closeness, the intimacy, the, uh, the bearing of yourself, the sharing of yourself is on the level of having sex with your mate. And don't kid yourself, if you're not married and having sex with someone, it is not the same. Unmarried sex is not the same as married sex. You can live together for years, you get married and things change. Psychologists have shown that over and over again through different kinds of studies. There's nothing like that relationship and uh, doing it beforehand, doing it with someone else that you've not made your vows to, it feels good. You may have a physical release, but it's not the same as what's happening between two of you after vows have been made in public with family and friends. And when you're living together through the good times and through the hard times, and when you see each other in the morning at your worst with morning breath and, uh, and scrubbed up hair, there's something about that part of the image of being in a marriage that Paul says is like the relationship between Christ and his church. Um, and he winds up by saying, this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In other words, Paul's point is, uh, you need to think about the intimacy in the marriage bed between a husband and wife, and there's something about that that is what God is saying I want, I expect. This is what I believe, he, sa he says, when, uh, when he, uh, he talks, about, uh, talks about marriage. So I've got another picture here I want to show you. This is, uh, well, get straight here. There it goes. This was paid, made, made years ago with Tammy and I. We were, we were still pretty young. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's pretty good. We were pretty young. We had, didn't have kids then. We were living up in, Col up in uh, Cripple Creek, Colorado. We had some friends that had one of those those uh, antique photo things where you dress up and you take the ten type looking pictures. And uh, that was what we looked like when we were young. And uh, I was uh, young and strong in that particular picture. They had actually taken a piece of, uh, of uh, electrical tape and blacked out one of my teeth. And uh, Tammy, was, Tammy was young. And uh, we had no idea what was, what was coming in the future. We had no idea. Here's another picture that I wanted to show you. Um, let me get it for you. Ah, here we go. Who are these kids? That was Tammy and I before we even got married. I picked her up that night at her, uh, her house on the edge of campus at West Texas State University. We went to the West Texas homecoming. And uh, I had my, my wide brown tie and my used car salesman plaid jacket. And uh, she had her big, huge stylishly famous big glasses. Uh, I had John uh, John Denver kind of glasses. My hair was parted in the middle. I had had a haircut before, uh, not, too, not too long before that. Weren't we, uh, weren't we quite a couple? And, uh, the point of the matter is this. You need to think about you. If you're a married person or con con contemplating marriage, you think about how it is that your marriage, your physical marriage to your physical partner says something about your relationship to Christ. What is it that God's trying to tell you when he says that he wants husbands to love wives the way Christ loves the church? What does that mean? What does it mean when he says he wants wives to be in submission to their husbands like the church is to Christ? Forget about the whole, well, I'm not going to be in submission to my husband, or I'm not going to sacrifice too much for my wife. Forget about the dysfunctions, even if they're inside your own head, even if they're inside your own family. What's Christ trying to say to you? The point is, think about the most healthy, wholesome marriage that you know. Take out all the mistakes. Make it as great and perfect as possible. And there's something about that image that God wants you to get. 
There's something God wants you to understand about his relationship to him and his people. The Bible says that the church is like a bride. It's like a bride. My favorite person in the entire world is, is Tammy Janelle. Her maiden name was Tammy Monday. And uh, her parents did a wonderful job. She is just right for me. And yet there's times that I just want to get in the car and drive. There's times that she just looks at me and I know. I know she doesn't dare open her mouth right now because she'll say something that she regrets. And yet we stick it out. And so do many of you. And that's the way it is with Christ and the church as well. Times will be tough. Things will be difficult. But in the church, the relationship with Christ is that of a husband and a wife who are sticking it out through thick and thin, through the good times with the kids, through the bad times with the bills. That's one of the images of the church. That's one of the reasons you need to be involved in church. That's why, one of the reasons why this whole idea of, you know, pajama church, sitting at home in your pajamas, drinking your hot chocolate or your coffee, uh, not gathering with God's people. If there's a physical reason, if there's a uh, electricity reason, if there's a weather reason, that's one thing. But if you're choosing to do that, what you're choosing to do is you're choosing to separate yourself from the bride of Christ. You say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm part of the bride of Christ. Yes, but the bride of Christ is always referred to as the group, as the church. It's the gathering. You can choose to be different. You can choose to stand apart. But it's very, very important that you stay faithful to your marriage, that you stay faithful to your part in that agreement. Why? Because so much depends on you. Now, yes, Jesus has done the heavy lifting, and yes, Jesus will forgive us, and yes, he'll take us back time and time again. But what if we reach the point where we're like the lazy spouse that refuses to do our part? We refuse to remain faithful to our promises. We refuse to be, and if that faithfulness, if that lack of faithfulness revolves around the, uh, well, I'm just not going to take care of them. I'm just not going to do my part to serve them. How is that any different than saying I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to be faithful to them in, in the marriage bed. I'm not going to be faithful to them in finances. There requires a it requires a faithfulness to be go, to go both ways. And the picture for the church is, we should look to healthy marriages. And that's what we should find and want in our churches. So I hope you'll think about these things today. I wish you well. If you're uh, like me and going to go out and start working on the cleaning up limbs, maybe you got started yesterday, uh, be careful. Um, if you're still without power and looking at this on Facebook, or if you're looking at it later when the power comes on, uh, God bless you. I've been praying for you. And uh, let's have a great week. And God willing, I'll see you again soon, either here on Facebook or live at our church building.